In this lesson, you'll learn about orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM. The fundamental principles of OFDM and the mathematics required were originally described in 1966 by Robert W. Chang while working for Bell Labs. But it wasn't until cheap microprocessors started to become widely available that OFDM would emerge as a viable alternative to existing communication technologies. The first practical applications of OFDM for broadcasting and mobile communications began to appear in the late 1980s, although some of the devices of the time were rather large and cumbersome. OFDM is so fast and spectrally efficient that it lies at the heart of many modern-day communication applications, including Wi-Fi, WiMAX, 3G LTE, 4G and 5G mobile phones, DAB radio, digital television, underwater communications and even fibre-optic cable networks. OFDM brings together and builds upon decades of research and development of a wide range of data encoding and modulation techniques. It's the pinnacle of wireless communication technology. In essence, OFDM is a simple idea, but of course the devil is in the detail. So how does it work? Let's take a look. One of the biggest challenges faced by mobile communications, such as Wi-Fi and cell phone technology, is an effect known as multipath fading. When a mobile device transmits a radio signal, in an ideal world, that signal will take the shortest possible path to its destination. But because the signal is radiating out in all directions, it will also bounce off walls and floors and other obstacles and echoes of the same signal will reach the destination via several different paths. To understand why this is a problem, suppose we have a stream of binary data that we want to transmit using BPSK modulation. You've already seen that line coding is a critical step in any type of modulation. With binary phase shift keying, the data stream is converted into a polar baseband signal in which a binary 1 is represented by a positive voltage and a binary 0 by a negative voltage. This sequence of symbols can then be used directly to modify a sinusoidal carrier wave and generate a radio signal like this. There are two possible waveforms in the modulated signal which differ in phase by 180 degrees. One waveform represents a binary 1 and the other a binary 0. In many applications, pulse shaping is employed in order to improve the spectral efficiency of the modulated signal. The baseband signal is sampled to produce a sequence of discrete pulses from which a new 2PAM baseband signal is generated. This new smoothed out signal is then used to modulate a sinusoidal carrier wave and because there are no sudden changes in phase, the modulated signal has a reduced bandwidth. Pulse shaping or not, both of these techniques are referred to as BPSK modulation because they use the same system of line coding. One symbol represents one binary digit. Now consider what might happen if an echo of the transmitted signal was to reach the receiver shortly after the main signal. The echo would have the same frequency as the signal that took the direct path, but it would have a lower amplitude because it would have lost more energy on the way. It would also be out of phase because it took longer to arrive. Potentially, an echo of the waveform that represents the first symbol could arrive while the waveform for the second symbol is being received via the more direct path. Overlapping signals of the same frequency will interfere with each other at the receiving antenna. The new signal that results from this interference will have the same frequency as the original, but a different amplitude and a different phase. A simple receiver would therefore have trouble distinguishing one symbol from the next. And, needless to say, it's highly likely that there will be more than just one echo. Depending on the environment, several overlapping reflections of the same signal could be arriving together. 
One way to deal with this so-called inter-symbol interference is to use an adaptive equaliser. This is actually a program running on a microprocessor inside the receiver. An equaliser can isolate the original signal from its echoes. But it's very processor intensive, which means it consumes a lot of power. And power consumption is a big consideration when it comes to battery operated devices like mobile phones. An equaliser can also struggle when the rate of data transmission is particularly high. An alternative approach, then, is to simply increase the time taken to transmit each symbol. Making the symbol period longer for a given frequency means that the amount of time that symbols overlap is less significant. An adaptive equaliser also has a better chance of keeping up. But of course, this means the data transmission rate is slower. Modern wireless applications demand ever higher board rates and fewer errors. So what can be done? One way to balance the need for speed with the need for a clear signal is to use a technique known as frequency division multiplexing. This involves breaking down the original serial data stream into a number of slower parallel data streams. Each stream is line coded separately, for example as it would be with BPSK modulation. Each stream of symbols is then modulated resulting in multiple signals. Most importantly, each signal is generated using a carrier wave oscillating at a different frequency from the others. These signals are then transmitted simultaneously. Yes, they will add together in the air, resulting in just one much more complicated looking wave, but because their frequencies are different, a receiver can separate them using filters demodulate them and reconstruct the original data. In this rather simplistic approach, we just have to make sure that the carriers are far enough apart on the frequency spectrum to minimise the possibility of the signals interfering with each other. The idea behind FDM can be applied to any method of modulation, including BPSK, QPSK, 8PSK and various orders of QAM, but of course the price to pay now is an increase in the overall bandwidth, and bandwidth, as we know, is in short supply. Frequency division multiplexing is not orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, but it's a big step in the right direction. Orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM, is similar in that it takes one fast serial bitstream and breaks it into many slow bitstreams but it does so in such a way as to keep the overall bandwidth down. OFDM takes advantage of two fundamental principles. First, the concept of orthogonal carriers. Suppose we have several sinusoidal carrier waves whose frequencies are whole number multiples of the same fundamental frequency. A set of perfect continuous sinusoids like these, when viewed in the frequency domain, would show up as discrete spikes. But when a sinusoid is time limited, its frequency spectrum is actually a sync function. These frequency spectra are therefore spread out and will overlap. However, as long as the frequencies of these carriers are whole number multiples of each other, their spectra will overlap in such a way as to ensure that when the power of any one carrier is at a maximum, all of the others will have no power at all. This means a receiver can distinguish one carrier from another even when their frequencies are very close together. The second fundamental principle behind OFDM is the Fourier transform, or at least an important variation of it. Recall that a Fourier transform can take any continuous time-based signal and calculate the frequencies of a set of sine and cosine waves which, when added together, would create that signal. When a Fourier transform is performed on this, not so square, continuous wave, the magnitude of each frequency component can be plotted on a chart. The chart clearly shows that there are five distinct 
frequency components. The discrete Fourier transform is similar to a Fourier transform, but it works with a finite number of data samples rather than a continuous wave, which of course is exactly what we need when working with digital data. By making the assumption that a set of samples is periodic, namely that it repeats forever, the DFT can calculate the frequency components of a digital data set. The result looks something like this. The fast Fourier transform, the FFT, is an algorithm that computes the discrete Fourier transform. The FFT is a particularly efficient way of doing this. An inverse fast Fourier transform, IFFT, is the reverse process. Given a set of frequencies, it can calculate a time domain signal. The FFT was invented in 1965 by James Cooley and John Tukey. It's a divide and conquer algorithm that relies on some pretty advanced mathematics, such as complex arithmetic, group theory and roots of unity. The detailed workings of the FFT are beyond the scope of this particular lesson, but suffice to say, it's considered by many computer scientists to be the most ingenious, if not beautiful, algorithm ever devised. The impact of the FFT has been nothing short of profound. It has made possible huge advances, not only in digital communication, but also in data compression, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. So how do all these techniques come together? The serial data stream is first split into multiple parallel streams. Each separate data stream is line coded. In this example, one bit from each stream is used to generate a BPSK symbol. With four parallel data streams, the time taken by one symbol in each stream is the same as the time that would have been taken by four symbols if the original data stream had been modulated without OFDM. In other words, the symbol rate is the same. Only four data streams are shown here to illustrate the principle, but in reality, OFDM uses 48. By the way, we could have used two bits from each stream to generate a set of QPSK symbols, or four bits from each stream to generate a set of 16 QAM signals. In fact, OFDM can be used in conjunction with pretty much any type of modulation. A group of parallel symbols is stored as a vector, and these symbols are now treated as if they were data in the frequency domain. An inverse fast Fourier transform is applied to the vector. The IFFT calculates the mathematical representations of a set of orthogonal carrier frequencies and stores them in a matrix. These are known as subcarriers. Only four subcarriers are shown here, but normally there are 64 spanning a 20 MHz channel within the 5 GHz frequency band. 52 of them are modulated, of which 48 carry actual data. A null subcarrier at the centre remains unmodulated, allowing the receiver to quickly synchronise with the transmitter. Four pilot subcarriers allow the receiver to maintain control. A few extra guard subcarriers are included at either end of the frequency range to minimise interference with devices operating on adjacent channels. Each symbol is mapped to one of the subcarriers and multiplied by it in order to scale its amplitude accordingly. The modified subcarriers are then added together, so the output of the IFFT is another vector which is the summation of the modified subcarriers. This output vector is assumed to be a set of time domain samples. The data in the output vector are converted from parallel to serial format, resulting in what is known as an OFDM symbol. The time-based data are now converted to an analogue signal, which is almost ready for transmission. The process repeats. Successive parallel groups of data are line-coded, transformed and modulated. A sequence of about 280 OFDM symbols is then transmitted in a burst, known as a frame. 
The exact number of symbols per frame depends on the technology, be it 4G, 5G or Wi-Fi, and the way the technology has been configured. But inter-symbol interference between OFDM symbols is still a real possibility. One way to tackle this is to leave a short time interval between OFDM symbols. Simply don't transmit anything. Alternatively, you could transmit a sequence of zeros between symbols. An echo might arrive at the receiver shortly after the main signal, and the two will combine to produce a new signal with a different amplitude and a different phase. But the information is contained within the frequency, so as long as there's a suitable gap between OFDM symbols and the sample period is appropriate, an adaptive equaliser should be able to compensate. On the other hand, if the gap between OFDM symbols is too small in relation to the delay between the original signal and its echo, then the information contained within one OFDM symbol will spill into the sampling period of the next and the combined signal will be unintelligible. And there's another issue that needs to be considered, even when there are no signal echoes to worry about. By simply dropping the amplitude to zero between symbols, the range of power values within the signal is greatly increased. The so-called peak to average power ratio is much bigger. Why is this an issue? Well, it's the job of the receiver to assign a numeric value to the amplitude of each sample. Suppose that the receiver was using only three bits to quantify the amplitude of each sample. Yes, this is an exaggeration, but bear with me. The receiver would therefore have to estimate some, indeed most, of the amplitudes in a process known as quantization. Now, suppose there's a big drop in amplitude between OFDM symbols, and these much lower amplitudes happen to fall within the sampling period. With a finite number of values available to quantify the amplitudes of all the samples, quantization estimates are bound to be less accurate, and ultimately, information will be lost. Of course, a real receiver uses many more than three bits to quantify the amplitude of each sample, so the quantization estimates are much better. But the number of possible values is nevertheless finite, and a high peak-to-average power ratio can make it impossible for the receiver to distinguish one sample from another. Standard OFDM gets around this particular problem by copying a small portion of each OFDM symbol from the end to the front. This is called a cyclic prefix. Typically, its duration will be equivalent to about 25% that of the OFDM symbol. The cyclic prefix not only serves as a guard interval to combat inter-symbol interference, but it does this whilst also keeping the peak to average power ratio down. At the receiver, each cyclic prefix is effectively removed by ignoring it when the signal is sampled. In summary, OFDM takes a serial data stream and breaks it down into several parallel streams. Each stream is line coded separately. A group of parallel symbols is then fed into an inverse fast Fourier transform. The IFFT calculates a set of orthogonal carrier frequencies, each of which is then modified by one of the symbols. The modulated subcarriers are combined to produce a vector of time domain samples which are then converted into serial format to give an OFDM symbol. The cyclic prefix is added to each symbol. About 280 OFDM symbols are transmitted in a burst with a short delay between each burst. At the receiver, the incoming signal is sampled and the cyclic prefix is effectively removed. Each OFDM symbol is converted back into a vector containing parallel data, and a fast Fourier transform is applied. The parallel data streams are decoded and the original serial data stream is put back together. And all of this happens very quickly indeed.